Welcome to Lesson 5b, Conservation of Energy. In this lesson, we'll derive the control volume equation for conservation of energy using the Reynolds Transport Theorem. We'll do some simplifications and an example problem. We start with the Reynolds Transport Theorem for a fixed control volume. For the system, we'll use the first law of thermodynamics, dE system dt equal q dot net in plus w dot net in. This term is the net rate of heat transfer into the system, and this term is the net rate of work done on the system. When either of these terms is positive, you're adding energy to the system. Note that rate of work, or work per unit time, is power. E sub cis is the total energy of the system. By that, we usually mean the fluid that is inside the system. In our Reynolds transport theorem, we'll let B system equal E system total energy, and then small b is just small e, the specific total energy. Combining these two, we write dE system dt equal q dot net in plus w dot net in equal ddt of the control volume integral, rho e dv, plus the control surface integral, rho e v dot n dA. This left portion is our system equation, and this right portion is our control volume equation. I typed out the part and circled with red. The conservation of energy equation for a fixed control volume is given here. So the Reynolds transport theorem has helped us derive this equation directly. I want to comment about why this works so well. If this is our fixed control volume, but the system is moving through the control volume, so at some later time it's here, but at the time under consideration, the system and control volume are coincident. In other words, they occupy the same volume at this particular time. Therefore, the system equation, which applies to the system, also applies to the control volume since it's exactly the same volume. So this is our final form for the equation for a fixed control volume. Now let's look at this specific total energy term. E is made up of specific internal energy. By the way, don't confuse this little u with the component of velocity in the x direction. This is capital U over m. Specific kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared divided by m, and specific potential energy, mgz divided by m. Let's plug that into the control surface integral, but for convenience we'll leave E as it is in the volume term. I call this alternate form 1 of conservation of energy for a fixed control volume. I'll call this equation 1. We'll come back to this equation, but first let's look at this term, the net power term. We'll split it into four components, w dot shaft net in, plus w dot pressure net in, plus w dot viscous net in, plus w dot other net in. Now let's examine each of these terms. This shaft power is power from a rotating shaft, or shafts, that cut through the control surface. So if this is a portion of our control volume, and we have a shaft that cuts through it, rotating at some angular velocity omega with some torque t, w dot shaft is equal to omega times t. Note that this term can be positive or negative. It's positive for a pump. Pump is a general term for a pump, compressor, a blower, a turbo machine that adds power to the fluid. And it's negative for a turbine, where we extract power from the fluid. Now let's look at the pressure term. Consider some rectangular control volume with an inlet 1 and an outlet 2. Suppose there's a pressure P1 acting at the inlet and a different pressure P2 acting at the outlet, and there's a flow through this control volume. At the inlet, we're pushing the fluid in the direction of the flow, so we're adding power to the fluid by this pressure and velocity. At an outlet, you're fighting against the fluid, so the control volume is doing work on you. So this net pressure in power is positive at the inlet and negative at an outlet. See the text for the derivation. Turns out that this term is equal to negative integral over the control surface, p over rho, rho v dot n dA. Because of the nature of the dot product, the signs take care of themselves at any inlet or outlet. Now consider this term. What do we mean by viscous power? If you have a moving wall, it will exert a shear stress tau on the fluid. And if our control volume butts against that moving wall, you will have a viscous power term. Viscosity is adding work or power to the control volume. But as we'll see in most of the problems in this course, this term is zero. By wise choice of control volumes, we'll see that we usually pick our control volume so that it does not butt up against moving walls. And then this term goes to zero. I'll say usually zero 
unless you have a situation like this. You can have other power added like electromagnetic forces acting on the fluid, but we won't consider any of those cases, so this last term will always be zero. Now let's plug all these into equation one. And notice that this pressure term has P over rho and then rho V dot NDA. And in the control surface integral of equation one, we have this grouping of terms times the same rho V dot NDA. So we're going to put this term into here. Then equation one becomes Q dot net in plus W dot shaft net in equal D dt of the control volume integral E rho dV plus the control surface integral of u plus p over rho. Notice that we had a minus sign here, but we put this term on the right instead of on the left, so the minus sign goes away. And then the other two terms are the same as equation one. And then we have our rho v dot nda. Notice that I've neglected the viscous power term, which will be the usual case in our problems. Well, if this were a live class, I'd ask, what is u plus p over rho? If you remember from your thermo class, specific enthalpy, some people say specific enthalpy, is equal to u plus p over rho, which is this term. Then I typed up the final form of this equation, which I call alternate form two, conservation of energy equation for a fixed control volume. I'll call that equation two. Notice that it is exact for a fixed control volume, as long as we pick a control volume where this viscous power term is zero, and we have no other power terms. Now let's do some simplifications. If we have well-defined inlets and outlets, as in this diagram, we can replace the control surface integral by summation signs over these inlets and outlets, where V dot NDA becomes just simply V times A, for cases where the velocity comes in perpendicular to the area, or goes out perpendicular to the area. We're allowing for some shaft power and some heat transfer. We approximate the control surface integral using average speed, average density, and area at each inlet and outlet. Let V equal V average at an inlet. If you have a compressible flow problem, rho is rho average at an inlet, and these also apply at outlets. And A is the area of the inlet or outlet. Thus we get this approximate form of the energy equation. Conservation of energy equation for a fixed control volume with well-defined inlets and outlets and nearly uniform velocity profiles. I put in this caveat because in general the velocity profiles are not uniform at outlets and inlets. And this kinetic energy term is not exact. We'll put in a correction factor to deal with that in our next lesson. For now let's assume that the velocity profiles are nearly uniform at any inlet or outlet. In other words, V is the average velocity, and it's nearly uniform, ignoring these small boundary layers. I call this alternate form 3. I'll call this equation 3, where we've replaced the integral by summations. Let me add H to my list, where H is the average specific enthalpy at an inlet or outlet. If your surface is not horizontal, Z itself would have to be the average. So all three of these are average values for both inlets and outlets. We can simplify even further if the flow is steady. You may have seen this terminology in your thermo class, steady state, steady flow. The steady state, steady flow energy equation for a control volume is just this equation with the unsteady term equal to zero. So this is the final form. It's the steady conservation of energy equation for a fixed control volume with well-defined inlets and outlets and nearly uniform velocity profiles. Some of you may have used this exact equation in your thermo class. Now we're ready to do an example. We can analyze things like compressors and turbines, etc., with our SSSF equation. Here we're looking at an air compressor. I give the mass flow rate, pressures and temperatures at the inlet and outlet, diameters of these pipes, and also the input shaft power coming into this compressor. We want to do a number of things, calculate the average velocity of the air entering the compressor. Well, this is just review of conservation of mass from the previous lesson. By the way, you can see that these units are all in English units. Even though I loathe the English system, it's still used in engineering. So this problem will give you some practice using the English system. So you already know how to do this part, and this is the result. Part B is to calculate the average velocity of the air leaving the compressor. This would be at this outlet 2. Call 1 the inlet and 2 the outlet. And then part C, we calculate the net rate of heat transfer from the air compressor into the room in units of BTU per hour. The first step in any control volume analysis is to choose a wise control volume. In this case, we want to slice through the outlet and the inlet. We definitely want to slice through the shaft, but the rest of it can go around the entire compressor. 
from our sign convention, Q dot net in is the heat transfer into the control volume. But we know that since we're adding power and this thing has inefficiencies, there will be heat loss from this turbo machine. So Q dot net in will be negative. We apply our SSSF equation and we want to solve for Q dot net in. Well, let's write this equation out. Q dot net in equal, put the power term on the right, negative W dot shaft net in. There's only one outlet, what we call two. So we have M dot times the quantity H2 plus V2 squared over 2 plus GZ2. Likewise, there's only one inlet, which we called one. So this term becomes the same thing except with subscripts one. We'll neglect the potential energy term since this is a gas. Typically, the potential energy change is negligible compared to these other terms when you're talking about a gas. If this were a liquid instead of a gas, we would need to keep in these terms. So let's simplify. Q dot net in equal negative W dot shaft net in. And noting that by conservation of mass, since there's only one inlet and one outlet, M dot has to be the same. So we can combine all these terms. We get M dot times H2 minus H1 plus V2 squared minus V1 squared over 2. The fluid here is air, which is an ideal gas. So from thermo, we know that H2 minus H1 is Cp times T2 minus T1, where Cp is the specific heat at constant pressure. So the final form of our equation is Q dot net in equal negative W dot shaft net in plus M dot times the quantity Cp T2 minus T1 plus V2 squared minus V1 squared over 2, in parentheses. This is our answer in variable form. Now we plug in our numbers and unit conversions. We also have to worry about negative signs. Since the shaft power is net in and we are adding power, this is a negative value. I'll put a unity conversion factor in blue, 2544.5 BTU per horsepower hour. The horsepower units cancel. M dot, I looked up CP, which is actually a function of temperature. So I use the average temperature to get CP in these English units. And this is T2 and T1 in Rankine. The Rankine units cancel also. And then finally this term, we know V1 and we square it. And we know V2 from previously and we square that and divide by 2 and close this big bracket. Now this is a lesson in unity conversion factors. In the English system, we have this unity conversion factor, this one, and then there's 3600 seconds per hour. And you can go through and verify that all the units cancel except BTU per hour. So Q dot net in turns out to be negative 4.71 times 10 to the fifth BTU per hour. I'll label V2 and V1 for consistency. A couple comments. Q dot net in is negative as expected since this compressor will give off heat. If you've ever been around a large compressor, you know that it puts out a lot of heat. This heat is wasted. We're adding all this shaft horsepower but some portion of it is wasted. In later lessons, we'll define an efficiency of a compressor or a turbine to take into account this wasted heat. A typical window air conditioning unit like you might have in your bedroom cools at a rate of about 5,000 BTU per hour. So this compressor requires our wasted heat, which is added into the room, divided by the cooling power of one air conditioner, which comes out to approximately 94 room air conditioning units so the bottom line is that this is a big compressor. One final comment is that most of our problems will be in metric units, but you still need to write out all your units so you don't lose some factors of a thousand, etc. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.